Георг идва за трети път в България. Първия път ни поговори от а, а, името като председател на а, фундация от, а, Free Software Foundation Europe. А, втория път дойде да ни говори малко за а, Colab. А, сега е а, управител на Notary Trade и ще ни поговори малко за блокчейн. И така, thank you, Georg. You have the floor. Thank you, Marian. Добър ден! It is great to be back here at the Open Fest. Um, we just counted, it's been three times, and every time with a different project and initiative, which is actually, I think, a good sign, because all the other ones worked out really, really well. And I'm here to present you um, the new thing, and it's actually really, really, really fresh. Um, so you're the first audience, and in fact, you will see that the presentation in some parts is still a little bit rough, because, well, it's all work in progress as everything in our community. So just briefly about myself. Um, so I've been in the open source free software community for the past 25 years, give or take. Started 92, 93 ish. I've been with the GNU project and a couple of other things. Um, here's probably my most notable achievements to date. Um, the la last one you will not yet know because um, that company, I will talk about it a little bit later, has literally just been incorporated, as in, you know, we, we incorporated it, I think, a week and a half ago. Um, so, very, very fresh. And what I want to talk about, essentially, is how we will work to build upon the ideas of the blockchain, cryptocurrency, token economy ideas, and bring that forward. I mean, it, it, if, you, if you know what I've been doing, the, the concept of giving control over technology, control over our environment to people, of, of building reliable social structures around that um, has been essentially my entire career. And the token economy to me is very, very fascinating. I mean, it, it's a very interesting idea. It's a, it's a new way of thinking um, which effectively brings a democratization of economic processes. It means access for all. It means peer-to-peer -peer trading ability. It's a new way of disrupting funding for new ventures. Um, and it removes a lot of the intermediaries, uh, uh, it empowers a lot of people. I mean, everyone by now, even the mainstream media have heard of Bitcoin and so on and so forth. And it's, it's a very, very fascinating and, and valuable achievement, and intellectually really, really a huge step ahead. But it's only just the beginning. I mean, it, it's really only where this whole thing just about begins, because the token economy goes much further. It's, it's about the idea of being able to tokenize interaction in a way that empowers people to work together over processes that um, span essentially the entire globe. I mean, when you look back at the invention of money, money, it was like money itself was invented effectively as a way for humans to be able to interact and trade with people that they do not know. Before, you know, you, you, you were living in your village and you could trade, I don't know, a, a, a cow against um, thatching a roof because, you know, that guy can actually do that very well and you know his ability to do that and so you could make a one-to-one -one trade. Um, money allowed that to happen over much larger areas and was very, very fundamental to allowing us to actually ultimately share labor. Right? It's, a, it's a very important function and specialization of society. And the token economy takes that to the next step. It's essentially as disruptive in the way it works as you know, our free software, the open source ecosystem, and the internet have been to a lot of other areas, which is why it is so interesting and exciting to follow this field right now because it feels a lot like the early 90s in the internet age when you know there was this new technology people were saying all right this is going to change things we see it's going to change things and people start the first you know implementations of 
new ideas on this platform, but no one has quite yet figured out what exactly are, is going to be the big thing, right? We're in a very early stage with lots of experimentation, and that's wonderful. It's actually very fascinating to be part of that. So the first and second generation um, of the, the blockchain um, cryptocurrency realm are very much based on the idea of total decentralization of everything, right? I mean, kind of the, this perfect ideal. You have these absolutely, you know, um, self-contained units that self-replicate, that self-heal. Everything is completely, you know, peer-to-peer. -peer. Every, everyone is, is just a, like a little cell that carries the whole, and, and it all go, grows from there. And that idea is very, very fascinating, um, and it carries a lot of idealism, um, but it also, as we today see, has its challenges. The first one is you need to create trust in such an ecosystem. Um, and the way that Bitcoin, for instance, is, is doing it is it chooses something called proof of work because you assume that everyone can participate, thus you also assume malicious actors can participate. Therefore, you need to find a way to create trust between parties that do not know each other. And proof of work, so doing a calculation and comparing the results effectively, um, is how that is done in virtually all the, the larger currencies today. Um, that means you are using compute power purely for the purpose of generating trust. Um, in other words, you are burning electricity in order to gain trust. At the end of the day, it boils down to, I can prove I have spent the electricity in order to become trustworthy. Therefore, I've paid the electricity bill, therefore I am trustworthy. That effectively is the core of the proof of work paradigm. That has side effects. First of all, Bitcoin itself right now requires about as much electricity as a small country. Um, and in fact, a very large part of Bitcoin mining, in fact, the, the largest part, which is why I took China here, is in China today. So we're using a lot of electricity that we generate, right, at, at great cost, and ecological as well as financial, in order to maintain trust in that system. That is pretty inefficient. I mean, when you look at it from a, you know, how efficient is the system, um, point of view, it's not terribly efficient. It's optimized for something else, right? The primary design goal was decentralization, not efficiency. And you cannot optimize for everything. In, in technology, we know that. You need to choose what you want to optimize for. But when you have inefficiency as a systemic, built-in aspect of any system, and you combine that with an area that lends itself to economies of scale, which in, a, in technology is very much the case, the natural result is an oligopoly. Um, you have a concentration of mining. 65% of the mining happens in China. So it's not actually all that decentralized, right? I mean, 65%, which means the critical mass to falsify the entire system, is within the jurisdiction of a single government, and not necessarily a government that everyone chooses to trust. So the primary goal of full decentralization, right, of like everyone is just equal and you, know, you and you could just be an equal participant in that system, is not really coming true. We see that it's not working because of the systemic approach taken. The other side effect that inefficiency gives us is that it is really, really slow. Um, Bitcoin does something like three transactions per second on average worldwide. Um, Ethereum does a few more, um, but even there, like, scalability is the number one main concern right now. People are trying to figure out how do we get this fast enough that we can use it in real-world transactions because for the token economy to become true, 
we need millions of transactions per second, not three. There's a orders of magnitude difference between what we want and what we can do right now. So we need to find different ways of approaching this. And people are, you know, trying different ways of, of you know, proof of stake, which effectively means you, you formalize the oligopoly, right? You say you have the largest pool of, of currency, thus you have the largest stake, thus you have more influence. But that's not all that fundamentally different from the system we live in already with the banks because they're also forming an oligopoly, and it's just governmentally created and governmentally issued and somewhat governmentally controlled. But at the end of the day, um, it's still a couple of actors that have a lot of influence. And the other problem we have is that we have certain social values that are currently also being challenged by this. Um, so, I mean, we all know all the discussions about, you know, money laundering, tax evasion, there's a lot of that going on in, in these currencies. Um, it's been used as an escape currency, which if you're in Switzerland, is actually a good thing because it, it reduces some of the, the, the pressure on the Swiss franc for you. So for us, it's actually a very good thing, but um, it also means some level of social abuse and some abuse can never be, I mean, abuse can never be fully stopped and we all have to live with a certain amount of abuse if we want to have freedom. However, and we also see that the core value of what we want to do with these initial coin offerings as an alternative way of funding new initiatives, they are also becoming undermined now. We're having a lot of, you know, fraudulent, plainly speaking, ICOs these days, um, to the point that, you know, financial authorities are stepping in in order to stop them because people are simply losing their money. Um, that means that we lose the ability to use this new method of funding which would give us so much benefits as society. And that cannot be a good thing. So when we were at the ICO summit in Zurich, I think a couple of weeks ago, um, the topic of how do we prevent and stop abuse, how do we create best practice in this field has been one of the, if not the dominant topic. And of course, then there's questions like general data protection regulation and other things which are fully going to affect these ecosystems. And we need to figure out how to make that happen because these systems are built to be very transparent. And as we know, for instance, for Bitcoin, not very anonymous. Because of these effects, Regulation is very much coming, and it's, everyone knows regulation is coming. The various regulators from the U.S., also China, Switzerland, a, a lot of the, the regulators are now looking at regulating the space, figuring out what do we need to do about it, um, what kind of asset does it actually represent, how does this work, um, what, do, what things do we need to put in place, starting from things like best practices for ICOs, which, you know, the, the term ICO is very much modeled after the IPO, so, you know, going to the stock market, um, making your initial public offering. Um, there you have disclosures, right? You have disclosures that you need to make, there's legal requirements for this, you need to have due process, all these things which ICOs currently do not have, but it is not unreasonable to assume something like this, probably and hopefully in a more lightweight manner, will be required for ICOs in future. So when we look at all of this, right, when we see that problem space, and I mean, we are, we are a problem space solving community. When we see the problem space, what can we do better? I mean, what are the, what are the things we can do better to get those benefits that the token economy promises to us and solve the issues that we're now seeing. And I believe, I mean, this is uh, my background, right? Um, the principles that we need to apply to this is, well, first of all, it needs to be fully based on free software on open source. So, I mean, I'm a use, study, share, and proof guy. Um, the four freedoms of free software, I believe, are essential and critical and crucial 
in creating our solutions. The other thing we need to understand is that technology does not social problems solve, not alone anyway. Um, technology can be a very, very good tool to solve social problems. It can help solve social problems. But it can also create new social problems. Technology itself is to some extent orthogonal to social issues. Um, it can or cannot help depending on how you apply it. So we need to understand, I believe, that the solution to these issues, to these challenges, is not going to be purely in technology. It's not going to be only a technical solution because technology itself is rarely the answer to social problems. Social problems have different aspects. And because I believe we should incrementally improve and we should, in fact, you know, use, study, share, improve, I also think we should not reinvent the wheel. Um, there is, for some aspects, for some things that we are now seeing as challenges, there is existing ways of solving that. There is existing approaches to solving that. And one of them, funnily, usually only comes up in this conversation as the, the group or profession soon to be replaced by a small shell script, um, which I do not believe is going to happen. Um, what I believe is that the lawyers and notaries are going to be transformed. They're going to work different in future. They're not going to disappear. And that is because of their basic function, their background of why they exist in society in the first place. Um, notaries in particular in many countries are privileged, I believe in Bulgaria as well, and are often from a legal background. In some countries, they're actually the same. For instance, in the canton of Zug, you're always a lawyer and a notary both. Um, so it, there's differences in local law for how exactly they work, but they, the function exists virtually everywhere. And it's because they are, by law, the arbitrator between a real and a virtual asset. If you look at how traditionally you're buying and selling a house, for instance, right? you're not every morning getting up get out your gun and establish whose house this is. If you want to know who that house belongs to, you go typically to an office where there is a book that says, this house belongs to this person. That book, that ledger, is just as virtual a representation of a real asset as a blockchain is. There is virtually no difference between them in principle, only that the technology used to represent them is different because well, paper has been around much longer. But they are, by law, the function that transacts these values. And it's not just there. I mean, you have all sorts of areas which are currently looking at blockchain, for instance, global trade, where you have very, very complicated contracts, letters of credit, um, so-called casibers, which are um, representing the value of the goods in a container, right? I mean, all these things are currently extremely complex, extremely costly, very administrative heavy, which is why these sectors of economy are currently looking at how can we use blockchain technologies, distributed ledger technologies in order to transform that process, cut out intermediaries, make it more lightweight, make it more efficient, more transparent for everyone that we interact with, because typically they find themselves in very, very complicated supplier networks. But when that container arrives, you will still typically want someone to say, yes, in fact, that container really contains the goods that I've paid for. And very often that person will be, in some way, a legally privileged person, depending on what exactly you're talking about, often a lawyer or a notary. The other part that lawyers and notaries both do is they protect their client's interest. That is their function in society. I mean, when you need someone to represent you toward 
a third party or the government or whatever, you typically take a lawyer. Right? They are the people who know the operating system of society, which is the legal body, and how it is interpreted, and they are versed in how to use that to protect your interests. Or, you know, to, to maybe say it a little bit uh, 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 more easily, um, ask yourself, where does the crypto revolutionary run if the government comes knocking? Does he take a lawyer or does he run to the blockchain? At the end of the day, the lawyers fulfill a very important critical role in society. They form an essential function, which is why with notary trade, we have by design said, let them play that role. Let them, in fact, be the party that protects the clients on the system against third parties. So with notary trade, which, ah, with notary trade, what we are looking to build now is a hyperscale blockchain cooperative, and that's a lot of buzzwords, I know. Um, it's just very hard to make it dense if you're, you know, if, you, if you're trying to describe a concept that is perhaps not as simple or as trivial as you would sometimes wish it. Now, the lawyers and notaries in notary trade, which is why it is called notary trade, are the parties that provide the very same function they provide normally for onboarding into the system, but also for being able to transact values into the system, right? If you want to tokenize a house, say, because you want to trade your apartment or whatever, um, you would still use a notary to make that an actual legally binding thing because whoever else later trades on that blockchain would want to know that that house actually exists and that needs someone to actually verify this. You will need this real life to virtual representation. The other part is that lawyers in the system can help us protect the privacy and pseudonymity of the clients because when the lawyer creates the account, onboards the individual users into a system, the system knows that this lawyer has done the onboarding. It does not know the identity of the person. So if at any point in time there is a third-party claim, say, by the government that thinks there's been money laundering, um, and they go to a court and say, here's my evidence. That can go to the lawyer because, I mean, notary trade, the cooperative, does not know who that person is by design. They can go to the lawyer, present their evidence. The lawyer can then decide how to proceed, including perhaps saying, yes, this is client X, Y, or Z. But they can also say, no, I don't think your actual argument here is strong enough. Give me more evidence. They are immediately put in the position of defending their client simply by the design of the system on a legal and social level. And this protects the system from regulation because you have your know your customer requirements, your anti-money laundering requirements, all of which the governments are going to insist on for any system that is interacting with real life economy. Once you want to actually tokenize things like bank transactions, um, trade, credit cards, whatever, I mean, you will need to somehow find a way to to address that, and in fact, some of the more successful cryptocurrency marketplaces already do that. Lucky, for instance, out of Switzerland, they have a very clear KYC onboarding process where you provide your identity to Lucky in order to get your account. Because otherwise, they know that they would not be able to obtain the licenses that they're currently seeking all over the world with the various um, you know, jurisdictions. In this case, we do not know the identity, but we know the lawyer who does. The other part is the hyperscale part. Um, what our system 
is going to achieve, what it's going to provide is unlimited capacity for the token economy. Virtually unlimited, because, and I will show this a little bit later, um, the demand itself drives the scale. And because we are building the system on a known and trusted platform that is then run by a cooperative of all the users, institutions, and use cases that provides full transparency to everyone about what is going on with the technology, with those servers, where are they placed, are they sufficiently distributed, is there one party that maybe has too many servers under their control? The orchestration of all of this is done transparently through a cooperative, transparent to everyone who wants to see it. Everyone can become a member of that cooperative. Because of that, we have a higher level of trust in the individual systems that we no longer need to use proof of work. We can actually use the full capacity of the system. So the governance aspect of this is very crucial to why this works. It's governance by cooperative. And maybe it is natural that this would come from Switzerland, because Switzerland is one of the most cooperative countries that I've ever seen. I mean, and I'm German originally, um, but I've lived in Switzerland for many, many years, and Switzerland itself, in fact, the, the, it, Switzerland calls itself an Eidgenossenschaft, Genossenschaft being the German word for, co for cooperative. Um, and you have the largest supermarkets and banks, and I mean, a lot of the, the large economic bodies are in fact cooperatives. They're run as cooperatives. And cooperatives are legally well understood. They're a firm, long-established legal model. So lawyers understand exactly how they work, which is good. Regulators understand how they work. Companies understand how they work. And they provide openness, transparency. They provide democratic rules inside. And a pretty good level of protection against oligopolies because in a cooperative, every member of the cooperative is equal. And that member can be you, or that member can be UBS, the bank. So even if a party gets very big, they will not get to dominate. At the same time, for the large parties that will work, use this system, it is very attractive because what most of them currently are trying to do is the same mistake they made in the early days of the internet, where every large company tried to create their own internet and then tried to convince everyone else to come onto their own internet. Um, I mean, that's literally what they tried to do back then. It sounds ridiculous today. But th that's exactly what they were trying to do then. It's exactly what they're trying to do today in the blockchain world. They're trying to build their own blockchain worlds, which of course, I mean, if you are a supplier or a competitor to that large entity, it is not very attractive to enter the system and put yourself fully at the mercy of your competitor or even your customer. I mean, you're, as a supplier in a lot of industries, you're getting squeezed extremely hard already. You would want an equal playground somewhere. The cooperative actually gives you that. It's a place where it can be at arm's length and on equal footing. A place to come together and trade and build these systems. So in order to somehow get this going, we needed to define what we are calling a minimum lovable product, the first thing that you can actually use, right? I mean, you, I mean, this is an infrastructure, essentially, so you need to somehow get this going somewhere. You need to create something that you can use and that makes sense for the very first use cases that now want to come on board. And that, for us, is a secure identity plus DocSafe with built-in notarization and legal protection through the various lawyers in the system then which means you have your secure cloud owned by a cooperative in which you can be a member, so you no longer need to give your identity to, say, a Google or an Amazon, right? We are, we're aiming for a mass market here. Most of the people are currently in those systems. So we give them an alternative identity owned by a cooperative where they have insight and, and transparency. And the DocSafe 
I mean, this is personal data, this is data ab about you, but that's also your documents, your contracts, and so on and so forth, from the digital realm in particular, because of the use cases that we see, which are in the area of banks. We're currently talking to um, one very large Swiss bank and um, a couple of other smaller ones. Um, the cryptocurrency exchanges, it's the privileged professions and it's the trade registry. So just you know, to give you some examples, for banks anywhere, lots, lots of large institutions right now, um, one of their biggest threats is GDPR. We spoke, actually we'll talk about that yesterday. In case you saw it, you will know that this is very real and very serious. It's the general data protection regulation which almost no larger um, company currently is prepared for. Um, they start to realize that after having slept behind the wheel for quite a while. Um, and this comes with very punitive damages. So effectively, as the um, chair of the Notary Trade Cooperative in founding, who is the data protection commissioner of the canton of Valais, says holding data for a bank becomes more dangerous than holding dirty money. It's more costly. So what they would like to do is they would like to find a way to, to interact with their customers in wealth management, for instance, at arm's length which means the customer with us in this model holds their own data because it's their cooperative, right? Their cooperative members, they have provided the servers very often that run this cooperative. And they are, in fact, then holding their own data and giving on a contractual basis through an API access to the bank so the bank can see the information that the customer allows them to see and then provide wealth management advice or whatever they want to do. Cryptocurrency exchanges, Lucky being a prime example, they run ICOs and a lot of them are fraudulent. A lot of the white papers keep changing all the time and the, the account data is sometimes not quite clear. Um, so they would like to know that their users are investing into something that is known and documented and in fact invest in the right place and later have a record of what they have invested where and for what purpose. So what they want, in, in very short, is a notary stamp on every ICO that they run. So the user, as a cryptocurrency user, can say, all right, I see this ICO, that, that sounds really interesting, uh, maybe I want to look at the white paper, all right, that's cool. And then you would want to know that when you invest there, it's not a scam. The notarization of this is the, verify pro the verification process that has happened can help you with that decision, can create security for this realm in order to protect the potential of the ICO. And of course, the trade registry is another very ex interesting example. The canton of Zug is um, very, very innovative. I mean, it's where most of the, the legal bodies, including the Ethereum Foundation and so on and so forth, um, in, the, in this realm are today. Um, and the trade registry right now runs a trial for creating new companies via the blockchain. So you can actually put the entire company registration process on the blockchain. In fact, the trade registry in Zook is the first one that I know of that has started to accept Bitcoin as payment for shares. So when you need to pay in your shares, right, to, to, to liberate the shares to create the company, they actually accept Bitcoin to do that today. Um, first one that I know of. I think they've had done this for two companies now. Um, so it's only in the beginning, but they are very, very much looking forward to doing this. And they, again, will need a system where the notaries can provide their documents in a notary, notarized way to the trade register. And the trade register will want to provide the documents about the company having been registered to the user, so it then ends up in the user's stock safe with notarization stamp and the trade registry authorization and so on and so forth. So these are the kind of use cases that we are looking at to implement first. So where do we start? So first of all, the notary server. The notary server is an actual server. Um, it is built by a new company, which is Verain, 
for, which is short for verified and sovereign, because it's about creating a verified, open, trustworthy, secure solution that gives sovereignty to people and society. That is the company that we just incorporated. That company will now start to build the Notary server. The Notary server itself is going to be built on openness to the most extent possible, which means we're going to use open power-based hardware because it's the most performant, most open hardware that we know of that can transact in this way. So we're going to use open power hardware and it's going to be fully open source, everything. So, I mean, the obvious candidate here being Hyperledger as the, the you know, business blockchain technology stack in the Linux Foundation. So we're already talking with IBM quite intensively, in fact, about working together. And um, we're, we're already starting to, to put together the first, okay, how do we go about building this collaboratively? And then, of course, the question is like, which file and sync, file sync and share solution will we then use as the um, you know, first iteration for our prototype? Because that's what we now need to do. We now need to build the prototype in order to then be able to move this all forward. Because the notary server then, and yes, I mean, as I said, it's work in progress, but um, you, I, I figured this is still useful to have in here. The way that this works for the cooperative is the users, institutions, investors, anyone buys servers, they provide them to the cooperative, so the server physically gets shipped to a location specified by the cooperative in an actual data center. And the cooperative oversees the distribution because you never want too many servers in one hand. Right? You want to make sure that you create plenty of pools under professional maintenance so you have an actual you know, professional operations company behind it because that creates more security in the actual um, platform. However, you don't want this to be too centralized. Therefore, you want it orchestrated but not held by the cooperative. So it orchestrates the data centers, the management, and so on and so forth, and then issues back the tokens to the users, institutions, investors. That's the notary trade coin, which is a utility token. And that utility token, that coin, can then be used, I mean, you can buy and sell them at cryptocurrency exchanges, right? So if you just want to use a little bit of capacity and you do not want to get a server, well, you got go to the cryptocurrency exchange, you buy the utility token, you use it. And you can use capacity out, out of the system. If you provided a server and you get more tokens than you actually needed, you can sell some at the cryptocurrency exchange. The token itself is a utility token that allows you to transact on the network, to use the capacity and the services of the network. And the token itself is also being used to distribute the revenues of the cooperative. So the cooperative orchestrates the distribution, it orchestrates the operation. It does not itself have hands on keyboard. That, that's given to, to several suppliers, and it also pays these suppliers to do that. But after these suppliers are paid, there's a certain amount of money left over. That money is then in tokens, right, in notary trade coin is then distributed to the holders of Notary Trade coin according to how many coins they hold. So at the end of the day, it's almost like a dividend where the people who participate in the system benefit from whatever revenue this creates. So in a way, the Notary Trade coin is the world's very first capacity-backed token. It's backed by the actual capacity of the server. And the demand will then grow the network because more demand means the value of the token goes up on the exchange. But that means at some point someone will say, I will buy the server, provide it to the cooperative, get the tokens and sell them at the cryptocurrency exchange and make an immediate profit. So the more demand on, this, on the system, the more it will grow. It will grow by usage organically, which actually means it 
becomes an infrastructure to build something like a cooperative blockchain internet that we all own together through the cooperative. Therefore, if you have use cases, please come to us. Bring us your use cases because we would be very interested in working with you. We're working with several um, actors in this field already, but frankly, I think working together is never something that you should limit. Our first step now is to work to build the prototype. That's what we are working on right now. We need to build that first prototype. And then for next year, we're planning to then actually do an ICO on Notary Trade itself to create the big bang that creates the, the first real like um, solid set of servers for proper capacity and proper distribution. That is going to be the, the big bang moment for the cooperative to then actually have enough servers that you already have a pretty big distribution going. So what we are looking for right now is partnerships, community partnerships, technology partnerships, business partnerships, people who, who find the idea fascinating, hopefully as fascinating as we find it, and want to help us make this happen, because I believe it is a very valuable thing to do, which is why I decided to actually give this my full attention now. And of course, also, we need people to work on this full time. So yes, indeed, we're also hiring. So if you are somehow interested in this field, please come and find us, me or Klaus, who's sitting in the back, who's also involved in this. Just wave your hand once so people see you. Excellent. Um, find us and talk to us because we want to work together. And that's all I had to say. Thank you very much. Hello. Uh, I like your idea of uh, uh, distributed uh, ledger of trust. Uh, this is very natural. Use of the blockchain technology. Uh, what I'm asking is how you plan to onboard the actual notaries, lawyers, to the system, because it is critical to the to the use, uh, actual use of the, the of your system. Yes, um, you, you're right. Just to repeat it quickly. So the question is, how do you get the lawyers and notaries involved? Because they are critical to the function, right? You want them involved, otherwise. Um, you're lacking a crucial component. And that's, that is a challenge because lawyers and notaries are not known to be risk-seeking or very innovative. I mean, there's exceptions to that rule, but there's a lot of them that are, in fact, um, let's say traditional. Um, so that's why we are working with the early adopting ones. I mean, the, the chair of the cooperative now that we're working with, he's a data protection commissioner in the canton of Wallis in Switzerland. He's also a lawyer and notary. And so we're working through the Swiss Notary Association first. Um, the canton of Zug is very interested in connecting us to its notary. So we will have a critical first mass of notaries, but also one of the co-founders of this new business that is now essentially moving this forward to orchestrators um, is a lawyer himself. So we have the ability to talk to lawyers in a good way, and we already have the first ones that have shown quite a bit of interest. Um, but yes, I mean, you're completely right. We have also identified this as one of the very important strategic areas that we need to push. So anyone who can help us with that, please do. Thank you very much for the lecture. So, you, as you said, you are going to make uh, ICO in 2018. Uh, I was wondering what is going to set the initial price of the coin and what uh, currency? I mean, are you going to step over uh, traditional currency or step on uh, some cryptocurrency for the initial coin offering? So the purpose of the initial coin offering is going to be to seed the initial network, right? Which means we need to place enough servers, ideally, you know, 50, 100, 200, 500, that would be perfect. Um, that means there's going to be a link to real currency and so far, as of course we need to purchase those servers, right? The people through the ICO ultimately purchase the server, servers are still paid in fiat typically, unless 
the hardware supplier were to say, yeah, we'll, we'll accept payment in cryptocurrency, which I'm not sure they will until then. Maybe, who knows? Um, so it will most likely have a link to fiat currency, which in fact means the, the notary trade coin, the utility token that comes out of this, will have a direct connection to fiat currency in the beginning. Um, because simply by purchase price of server, right? Um, I mean, it, it, it doesn't really quite matter. I mean, one NTC right now is about 3,000 Swiss franc, but um, at the end of the day, I mean, it could be anything, right? That's an arbitrary choice that you say that this server profile gives you these many NTCs. And the cooperative, in fact, just to you know, expand on this, in future will then maintain the hardware profile. Part of the NTC turnover will go into um, creating a reserve to replace hardware as it, as it you know, falls out of service, breaks, whatever. One part of it. The other part is it needs to, in future, specify hardware profiles that you can buy because, of course, technology on the hardware side is also not stopping, right? The server we would use next year is most likely a Power 9-based server, but three years, four years from now, it'll be Power 10, and then Power 11 eventually, or maybe even something else again. So um, the cooperative will, through its cooperative organs, decide what profile, how many NTC, and thus has the ability to, to keep, you know, um, influencing that, setting a, 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 keeping it in, within a certain bandwidth, um, but it's going to be a cooperative decision. Thank you. I think you mentioned at some point that the cooperative will prove identity to third parties. Uh, is the, yeah. okay. we've, we've been cut off, but yes, very good question. Let's talk about that. that There's an EU regulation that says how that can be done, and I think only the state is generally... I'm sorry, we need to prepare for the next talk, which yes, starts I'm in so a few I'm, minutes. Yes, I'm, I'm very sorry, but yes, let, let's have a chat. Um, and thank you very much for, for, for the attention. And, you know.